So friends, on behalf of the Baha'i Chair for Studies in Development, uh, I would like to welcome uh, our distinguished uh, speaker for today, uh, Professor Mangesh Teli, who is a renowned academician and scientist in the field of textile technologies. Uh, he will be speaking with us on the theme of technology and ethics for sustainable development. This lecture is part of the series that uh, has been uh, conducted by the Baha'i Chair called Dialogues on Development. And uh, we would also like to welcome all our uh, participants in this lecture who have joined us both on Facebook, where this lecture is being broadcast live, as well as on Zoom. Friends, uh, the, the uh, Professor Taley will, will make his comments for uh, the first uh, 40, 45 minutes. And after that, we will have time for taking your questions and comments. So please make a note of your questions and your comments and post them on the Q&A box. And uh, uh, Professor Taley will take them up once he has uh, made his comments. Uh, the theme of our lecture today, as I mentioned, is technology and ethics for sustainable development. This lecture will explore the nexus between technology and ethics in the context of promoting the broad objective of sustainable development. Professor Mangesh Teli, a renowned academician and scientist in the field of textile technologies, will draw upon his own research work in developing sustainable technologies to shed light on the implications of ensuring that the developmental potential of new technologies are oriented by ethical frameworks in serving the common good. Just a few words about our distinguished speaker today, Professor Mangesh D. Teli is a former member of the Board of Governors of the Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai. He has over 40 years of experience as an academician during which he served as professor and head of the Department of Textile Chemistry. He guided over 150 research students and has 450 publications to his name. Professor Taley is the recipient of various fellowships and awards for academic excellence. And he is an honorary fellow of the Maharashtra Academy of Sciences and the Textile Association of India. In addition to this, his expertise in textile technology has been drawn upon by initiatives involving the highest levels of government and industry. With these initial comments, I would like to warmly welcome Professor Taley to please enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Professor. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Arash. Really, uh, it is a pleasure for me. This is the first time to be able to uh, deliver this lecture to your student there. Uh, and the, today's topic is technology and ethics for sustainable development. Uh, Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, whenever when we talk about the technology and ethics for sustainable development, moment the point of development comes, we talk about the development of the society, but before that on the back of mind, and it is rightly so, that we think about how I should develop myself, my own personality, my own family, my own near ones and dear ones, how, how do I contribute for their you know, success? And then subsequently uh, comes uh, the society. And when we talk about successful person, because today we always compare our success with others. It is almost even if we don't want to you know, uh, uh, do that, but then comparison always comes through. And so depending upon what kind of attitude we possess, so accordingly, you know, uh, our goals also go on changing. For a purely materialistic person, money-minded uh, person, if he, then he think about that how I 
could have the financial security and more and more money are and because most of the time it is you know at the back of my our mind it is always so that if you have money you can manage most of the thing so this consumeristic attitude is there and so many a times you know success when we talk about our own success if i am financially not sound if i don't have enough money then within my in in my own eyes i am not considered myself i am not considering myself as successful forget about my relatives forget about my friends and many a times even my own parents say that see in your own your own batchmate has you know got so many you know the facilities and such a good house and all and what did you ever uh, do with your own life so you know that's how the when, whenever we are you know uh, having insufficient financial security we consider or tend to think that we are not successful and then the success so naturally the definition of success comes to what kind of physical facilities i have what kind of house i live in what kind of car i travel and so on so here so come what may then because of this kind of a societal attitude to look at a person and his or her own success so naturally everyone think that what is that profession which i should select so that i can make um, more money faster money and uh, you know sufficient money and money is never sufficient for anyone so come what may one wants more and more things almost sometimes we tend to do or earn want to earn money at any cost and by this particular you know this kind of uh, you know the cutthroat competition then we sometimes do what is certain things which we are not supposed to do like for example a player or uh, this a weightlifter samancha chanu now and all you know this this is a title of one of the uh, newspaper cutting and all fall down so all these people swimming and wrestling uh, champions and all that but they were found uh, you know the, their uh, urine samples were do uh, you know and they they had taken the drug so in order to improve the performance one can one goes to any level hope beyond do indian weightlifters looking at the you know the uh, drug ridden you know the whole whole contingent was drug ridden so it what it means not that they didn't uh, they wanted to take the drug but uh, the the kind of you know the craving for success was so much that they couldn't resist the temptation and they felt oh we will even you know uh, uh, somehow the other pull the people and then we can get this particular medal but is it that uh, that important that one has to you know uh, go for, for such type of wrong way or this is again a newspaper cutting only about 500 billion dollars stash away in by indians in switzerland so the corruption has become almost you know the part of the system in every strata of society you know and uh, this is only because we have the perverted or distorted uh, view of our success because we feel that we will be considered uh, you know successful only when we have this kind of you know the uh, financial stability we have this kind of facilities or sometimes the publicity and the popularity and so on so cost of such success when you go after such success at any cost you want to do uh, 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 then it becomes very very uh, you know horrible that the compulsions of competitions deviate you to do the things which are you are not sometimes comfortable to do not that every individual whosoever may be the individual nobody by his or her own choice want to do a corrupt or don't to follow the corrupt practices but then they get tempted to do so because uh you know they don't have uh, that much control or self restraint to follow the ethical standards and so they then they get into that uh, you know uh, kind of a, a flow so if you see up to 40 the age if you see we sacrifice everything to accumulate wealth and that is how we look after our family our young you know children when they 
grow we don't even know and from right from morning till evening we are busy 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 and why we are doing it we are earning money and we also justify to the family saying that i am earning for you all but then actually after 40 then you even suffers on health and then whatever the you know the money he or uh, she has going again all that money again gets lost in you know medical expenses and to re, you know and get regaining the health which was, was lost so then end of the day you have to ask your question one question that is it worth doing all that so this is a rat race and as it is said that in this rat race if we go on competing with others in this rat race even the winner is going to be a bigger rat. So we have to be conscious that is this the way we are supposed to live our life? And then comes to, then what do I consider as uh, the uh, right parameters or coordinates of a successful life? I am sure I am not here through this lecture wanting to indicate that the, you know, the money is not important. Sound financial stability is very, very important, even for you want to do the social work or help the needy. Financial stability you need to have. But how much is financial stability is a real stability. You need to look, be able to live the decent life. And at the same time, you should be also able to help the underprivileged people. And so to that extent, you should develop the sound financial stability, your own children, you should be able to educate them, the, you know, the medical facility to your parents, you can offer them. And for that, you need a financial staff. But along with that, you cannot ignore your health. If you are not at all healthy, and if you are a sick early person, then whatever is success in the financial side you achieved, again, you are at loss. Peaceful and united, coherent family life. I have seen many people who are financially sound, but health is not good. The family is broken. There is no peace in the family. So another dimension is a family has to be peaceful because end of the day in the evening, when you return home, you have to, you need a peaceful life and enough opportunities to progress professionally. This is also very important. Many of us just ignore it, but wherever and whatever profession you do, Professionally, you should say, okay, five years back, I joined this job. But after five years, maybe my salary may not have increased into that many fold. But am I, have I progressed? Intellectually, have I progressed? Am I finding joy in my working? If yes, then it's fine. You know, that job is good. So enough opportunity to progress is equally important in your job. And then good social life. That are you also with the society and social friends you have and are you you know enjoying that so sound financial facility stability good health peaceful and united family life enough opportunities to progress professionally good social life and all these five parameters on which to certain extent more than 50 percent if you have progressed then the, again one more question comes and that is very important is the ethical orientation reflecting in all your actions so you have to ask yourself because moment the question of ethics comes, outsider, outside agency cannot decide about your ethics. It is you who, you know, you yourself is the, actually the real judge for your ethical life, which you have followed. Nobody else can say. So when it comes to now, let us look at the condition of the world today. The world today, the rapidly growing population and is going to hit by nine billion by 2050 consumption is increasing and when the consumption is increasing everybody is going for unbridled production and manufacturing world is heading towards shortage of raw materials so fossil fuel shortage as well as water water demand is predicted to increase by 55 percent worldwide 2.7 billion people already live in the areas of scarcity Current levels of carbon dioxide emissions are really alarming and the global temperature is rising for almost for two degrees and going to rise by 2040. So these are the reports which are really alarming. 
and global warming is actually happening and we are seeing how the seasons are changed how the you know the flood situation the drought situation hurricane situation everywhere we are finding that the natural disasters every country is being faced with so unless the current paradigm of take make and waste so whatever you want you just make it and again once it is used you just throw it out this is how if this kind of attitude is going to be of ours then naturally we will be consume more so we need to manufacture more and if we need to manufacture more we will consume all the raw material resources and energy as, as well you know the reserves and so on so it is mahatma gandhi says there is a sufficiency in the world for man's need but not for man's greed and so really again it comes it's again a ethical standard that you need to have a self control if you go on you know becoming the victim of greed then you will surely not be able to you know the uh, address the need constant increase in the violence everywhere because there are disparity economic disparities and some people are not getting anything to eat whereas some people are you know uh, so much of wealth and so they don't have a problem at all for next 10 generations so the population if you see you know conditions again for the see that 2.4 billion people they earn less than 2 dollar a day 800 million live every day without food 1.3 billion have no access to clean water 3 billion have inadequate sanitation 1 billion born in this century are illiterate one sixth of the world is always hungry 800 million die every year so this is kind of a statistic or global level we are not talking about only india because now such problems which we are faced with they are not you know india specific or country specific they are all global problem and so the solutions also have to be adopted globally so condition of our children 2.2 billion children are there out of that 1 billion in abject poverty 120 million can't go to school 640 million are without shelter and 30000 children die every day so these are the certain you know pretty old figures if, if today you find the still this disparity has further increased and that is why we have to then check then all these years all these years haven't we really uh, taken development dialogue further and haven't we really made uh any development in different strata of so, uh, you know the field yes we have great investment of time energy and resources have been done based on the most a uh, dedicated individuals and organizations they have contributed their service and they have really contributed their share to bring about the development in the world many approaches tried no stone left unturned many lessons learned tremendous progress in many years have been done but is it sufficient if you look at it the gap between the rich and poor is widening 20% of the world's population has access to 84% of the world's wealth so it is not that world's wealth is not increasing but it is concentrated in only one fifth of the world uh, only those few and then the, uh, the you know the four fifth that is 80% of the population they are really are suffering 1.2 billion are actually living in absolute poverty so then the realization is that you know that having done so much of development still this is not the world that we were hoping for how has this deplorable situation come about and why this is this kind of a situation is existing and so the question before us is there is an observation at a global level is being found and that is decision making has been based on a fundamentally materialistic view of existence and has essentially ignored the spiritual nature of the human being now these are the some of the you know the thoughts i have you know called from institute of studies in global prosperity which is again a new york based uh, the institute and uh, you know uh, they uh, they they have 
come up this conclusion, this materialistic development paradigm has proven not only insufficient, but fundamentally flawed. A new paradigm is needed. So if you look at, you know, any development project, we always say, oh, if it is a, a homeless people, they want to have the houses, you know, in Bombay or in Indore or these places, you give, you know, the affordable housing. Then those who don't have the houses, we give them the house. With those who don't have the enough shelter, then we, uh, yeah, enough clothing, then we try to provide them. Those who don't have enough, you know, the food, we try to supply them. But these are, you know, where we consider that the human being is a physical being. And as long as his physical well-being is taken care of, the development will take place. But nothing, not so. Because many a times, we need to look at the other dimension of a human being. Is man just a physical body or is he, again, uh, you know, the spiritual being too? And then we realize it. Many a times, you know, we, you know, we, we, when we talk about soul, you know, we always in the universities and all, we feel yourself, you know, oh, somebody will ridicule me. Somebody will laugh at me. Why, how do I talk about soul, which is rational soul? I cannot show, you know, it doesn't have dimension. I cannot give the existence, you know, the physical proof for it. But then what proof you need? Every individual has a soul and he is living with that soul. And in fact, the material nature is a person's body. And most of the 24 hours, if you see whatever we do, whatever the facilities we use, whatever the comforts we uh, you know, take, uh, take advantage of, the money, all that what we do is only for the comfort of body, for our health, for our, you know, the physical well-being, for our, you know, healthy life and so on. But where is the soul? And it is soul which actually many of us know, we know this fact. That suppose if I am physically perfectly fine, but can anybody make or initiate me to come on? For example, I am giving this lecture for you now. Can anybody force me to give this lecture here? It is unless and until my soul or my mind doesn't want me to share the thought, nothing, even your, your technology is there, my computer is here, everything is available. So merely having the facilities before us, and that is how the comfort of the body, but that does not make anyone really get up and work or take the initiative. The real motivation will come from the soul. And it is, that is why the soul is the one in human being, is the one who decide why to do the certain thing. And then the body or the you know, rest of the things are the one which we use just to get the work done. So who does decide the agenda? The agenda is decided by soul. And who you know implements that uh, agenda? the body implements that agenda and for which we need a different types of skills and so on. So soul and body, uh, both are equally important for every individual. So we have to have, understand this and recognize this, that the true reality of man is spiritual. Now I was talking about the development. Now if all these physical facilities, house, shelter, food, everything you give, but it is like a Chinese verb. You give them the food for a day, you are feeding him for a day. But if you teach him or her fishing, you are feeding for a lifetime. So what the development really has to be is that it should be a capacity building. It should be empowering so that an individual takes his own destiny in his own hand. He doesn't remain dependent on the outside help as long as we are made to be dependent on outside help. We will never be developing. And so all this so much of population or people at the, you know, below poverty line or the, at the bottom of pyramids, they will never be able to, you know, really take their destiny in their hand unless and until there are programs, unless and until there are, you know, development projects wherein their own capacity is developed. And what kind of, the mental capacity, 
then their own innate, you know, the various qualities. For example, there is a, you know, the, uh, their belief in uh, cooperation, their belief in, uh, you know, the goodness, their belief in uh, the oneness of uh, mankind. There is belief in, yeah, we have to follow the path of ethics. All this, unless and until they are there, compassion, fairness, justice, peace, and all these qualities do not come from the physical body. They have the origin from our soul. It is the Atma or soul. And you know, all the religions talk about, you know, the uh, uh, immortality of soul. And it is the body which we know at the end of our life term, it is going to perish. But what is going to remain is the soul, which is, you know, um, uh, soul, which in fact, you know, makes us more compassionate, more fair, more just, more peaceful, more united. And then only the real we, that our real contribution to the building of the society is out of the innate qualities of the soul and not the physical body. Of course, the physical body is equally important, even if you want to show compassion or fairness or to be just or to be peaceful. Of course, the body helps you to provide that expression and you can get to, uh, you know, do that. So there is one very important aspect which we uh, just now we look at it. You know, the knowledge system, there are, there are two streams of knowledge. Synerg and there is a synergistic interaction of science and religion. The two streams of knowledge are one is science and another one is religion. So moment when we talk about science, science is the one which is an investigation of material principles that govern this world. And so many scientists and they have made really a great contribution until today. Just now, even I am talking to you, it is because of the science. But this science is simply, uh, you know, the pure science, which is, okay, light travels in straight line. But that science is in day-to-day, -day, you know, day-to-day -day application of science is technology. So this is a computer, this is the internet technology. Internet is not science, internet is technology. It's the application of science in day-to-day, -day, you know, life, and that is technology. So just as, Though science is the mother of technology, but day-to-day -day life, the application of science is technology and we make use of technology. Similarly, the religion is an investigation of a spiritual principles that underlie this world. So in this world, I'm not talking about a religion, all, all different types of religion, all of them, they are true. All of them have same foundation. And all of them talk about love, fellowship, cooperation, and so on. So this religion, whichever religion, every religion is true and every religion shows only the goodness about it. And this religion itself is the one which provides the food for our soul. Just as the science and technology, you know, nurture our body, our physical body, the soul is nurtured by our religious teaching, our belief system. And this religion, when we want to practice is in day-to-day -day life, it is the morality or ethics, which call it, we call it as morality or ethics. So religious principle of compassion, being compassionate, being just, being fair, being ethical, being honest. Where are these particular, you know, such a most important qualities in our life where do they come from? They are not from our postgraduate courses or PhD courses or any of the scientific books. They all come from a religious book, or our religious belief system. And so day-to-day -day practice of religion is in the form of ethics. And that is why ethics is important. If there is no ethic, because ethic cannot be without a belief in religion, our religious view. And that is what the sanskar, all of us, our family values, you know, they give us this sanskar and ethical standards are nurtured in every single family. And these, it's most of the ethical standards are universal. So it is not that in India, one kind of ethics and then the other countries are the kind of ethic. ethics. Ethics uh, is very important. So just as the physical body 
and our soul, both of them have to be well progressed, balanced, so that you know the complete our output of an individual is possible. Similarly, the technology and ethics, they should also synergize and there should be a balance so that whenever we want to make use of technology to achieve a certain goal, certain objective, it is the ethics which first of all puts the agenda, that this is your agenda. This technology is to be used for this goodness. If the technology is going to destroy the world, you better not make use of it. Though technology is available, but it is the ethics which will desist us from using such kind of technology where which are you know disastrous so always it is the ethics which puts the agenda whether to do or not to do and then the technology tells us how to do and where to do and when to do and all that so both are equally important but an enlightened soul you know or ethical commitment when the soul has it then the technology which is going to be used is always for the betterment and such a development is always going to be you know sustainable so when we talk about religion as a belief system it is actually the source of ethics so many times we whenever we talk about religion we feel again frightened oh how do i talk about religion i am not talking here a, a religion or b religion or c religion hinduism buddhism zoroastrianism judaism christianity islam baha'i and each one they have their own founders lord krishna lord buddha zoroaster we we respect all of these you know the past prophets and bahai for baha baha is given bahai faith and so on for the latest one but all these religious you know they always have taught us about compassion love fairness honesty and that is why we should start respecting rather than you know competing we should respect each other's religion and we understand and in fact we va should value these religious beliefs mainly because in the world whatever the goodness which is existing it owes to the religion it is owes to the religion but what religion the not the religion which is used for a political purpose not the irreligion the, not the religion which divides us the religion which unites the whole world that kind of that means the very very essence of every single religion is same maybe their social principles may appear to be different but the essence of all religion is same so we have to really value this religion and we should never shy away of talking talking about our belief system we shouldn't say that it is age old thing why do i talk this in colleges or university but is exactly today if you see the whole world is going to the corruption and there is only the ethics which is going to you know going to protect us the where from the ethics is going to come so ethics comes from you know the only the religious sanskars or our religion and whatever the religion which we believe and that is why we need to see what are our age-old teachings. Now, just imagine recently, you know, you know this is where, you know, the sign, uh, uh, this one, uh, uh, our, uh, you know, science, religion, science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. This is what Einstein says. And it is important because if the, there is no religion, the science will only, you know, will be, will, is um, lame, it is incomplete. And if the religion without science, if there is no science and only religion, we say that we could become uh, blind. So we have to have the, you know, the balanced progress of science and religion together. One, you know, they contributes towards the progress of the body. The other contributes towards the enlightenment of soul. And soul and body is the one reality of a human being. It is not only body. Until today, whatever the projects will have been planned, very nicely, new theories, everything, but why they have not become effective and longer lasting? Because they fail to build the capacity among the individuals. And same people again and again and again remain dependent because capacity was not built. And that is why empowerment is equally 
uh, empowerment is important. So the ethical life today, if we how to live in a modern life, then what are the kind of you know the you know the mindset we should have is equally important because I have described you the condition of the world, but now how this world, uh, what kind of remedy we can offer to this world, and then we realize that just like our Prime Minister, uh, uh, you know Modi mentioned about Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. And this uh, in G20, this happened. And you know, this is not just a simple, uh, you know, the whim that uh, uh, said about so many years back in Upanishada. One world, one people, oneness of mankind. This is a time, this is today's time. We have to think in terms of the whole world as one. All peoples of the world as one people. And we have to talk about the oneness of mankind. So somebody at to some corner of the world if he, they are in difficulty, it is our problem we should take it. And we have to try to offer as much as possible the cooperation to them. Gender equality, this is also another thing. You can imagine, can we be successful without having the respect to gender equality? We cannot. So everywhere in every state of society, the man and woman equality has to be recognized. Foundation of all religion is one. If we don't accept this, again, we will be fighting on the basis of religion. So this is also equally important because all are, you know, you know, we are creation of one God. Eradication of all forms of prejudices that is based on the language, based on the religion, based on the caste, based on the creed. This kind of prejudices we cannot have. If I am a businessman, I cannot, you know, you know, just make the business only for one caste or one, you know, the uh, religious people, one set of religious people. I have to keep my business open to everyone. So I cannot have any prejudices there. Consultation should be used as a bedrock for conflict resolution. There is absolutely no room for wars. And it is very important that every single problem, if in a proper spirit of consultation, could be solved and that particular belief. Uh, and this belief can come from if our soul is enlightened. If we are governed by the satanic, you know, the uh, qualities of body, and then we will not believe in that. But otherwise, our soul and its in the potential of ours to, and our ability to solve the conflicts by consultation, we will always have faith in it respect to all cultures and unity in diversity cooperation and coexistence to take precedence over competition and exploitation today we see everybody whenever he gets opportunity he tries to compete he tries to exploit at the cost of the other for no now is the time we have to cooperate and coexist and development is in the form of capacity development and spiritual solution to the economic problem because of we have the economic problem, but these economic problems are not because of we have less of money, we have less of development, we have you know less of resources. No, it is not equitable distribution of all these things. And so who will look at it? Only the spiritual solution. That means our soul will sense it, that no, most of the things are going on one side in the developed world, where are the developing world? is uh, you know said uh, starved to death now that cannot be the situation recently one of the very good example and what happened during our covid 19 and what are the lessons we learned from this covid 19 is itself is a technology we developed so so vaccines no man rich or poor was exempted from this natural calamity and you see the developed countries the riches of the rich he also really shivered as far as COVID-19 concerned. So it was not that, oh, he was secured in his own mansion because of a simple virus could bring the world to the knees and developed world or developing world both equally, you know, it happened. And almost two years, this threat to the human life persisted and vaccination became decisive factor. And so unfortunate it is that the developed world many a times they didn't, you know, they increased the cost of the vaccines and it became only the monopoly of the rich countries. 
But what do you know? Can we in this world live like that, where most of the half of the world is left to die because of want of money or because of want of technology? What is the use of that technology if the technology is not in the reach of the common man? And I am so happy and proud to say that Prime Minister, uh, you know, he talked about not only just Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, but you know, he also made this vaccine. India had almost two vaccines ready. Other two were almost kept standby. And India displayed the spirit of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam and sent vaccine to more than 150 countries in developing region. And all free. Never expected that the business to be made out of it. And if India, a developing country, who always need more of the money also, but did not bother, you know, and only believed in the spirit of sacrifice. And that is, the spirit of sacrifice comes out of your, you know, the ethical standard. And this Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam has become our, you know, the innate nature we need to believe. And so you imagine what was the, you know, the acceptance of India all over the globe. Everybody, all of a sudden, everybody started respecting India as a country because they, they offer this 150 countries in developing this vaccine. Of course, it may not have been totally sufficient, but it was a great step. Never made business out of this disaster. So, you know, India even shared a COVID app. It's again a great, you know, invention. I know that's again a technology which where COVID so easy for one to get, you know, you are registered, then get your vaccine, get it noted down, and all became seamless. We have also this, uh, you know, the uh, unique ID, UID system, you know, the Aadhaar card system. So some of these technologies are so sustainable and they all have the ethical standard, you know, and they are believed, believed that it should be for masses. It is because many times we develop technology, but the technology uh, itself also divides that those who have technology and those who have not. And such a technology is really not going to do any good. So India has cheapest data. And in COVID, due to internet connectivity, millions of students took the online lessons. So these are some of the examples of the technology. But these technologies were available. But who made, you know, India to share this vaccine to other? It is not by anything else, but it is our soul. This is enlightened soul. It is ethical standards which made that. Now imagine this, look at this beggar. Spends rupees 300 and save the abundant child. So when you want to help anybody, a beggar can, you know, help the child and spend money on, uh, you know, uh, uh, saving the abundant child. It means that the ethical standard or ethical commitment does not, is not a monopoly of a rich people, neither it is a monopoly of a poor people. It is finally end of the day, to what extent one's soul is enlightened. So today we see corruption, degeneration of cultures, disintegration of the society, because our standards are eroded, you know, commercial issues dominate, technological issues, uh, somehow the other we have to get realized because technology is a direct proof that it gives you advantages. But ethical issues are disregarded. You know, once upon a time, it was said that if the money is lost, uh, you know, nothing is lost, health is lost, something is lost, and the, uh, you know, the character is lost, everything is lost. Today, it is just the reverse. If the character is lost, nothing is lost. If the uh, money is lost, uh, health is lost, something is lost. And if the money is lost, everything is lost. So today, we have come to a, such a situation that we consider money is everything. And if we suffer a losses, some of, some of the people don't have patience to continue life and they commit suicide. So this is not correct. So what is sustainability? You know, we, we were talking about this sustainability here. We say so, so sustainability is a development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of the future generation. So we need to not only make our, you know, the commercial ventures, you know, 
um, uh, basically uh, economically profitable, but at the same time, our social performance and environmental performance should be also equally balanced. So we have to try to reduce, reuse, recycle, restore, replenish. All this, when you want to see the reduce, reuse, recycle, everything calls for your self-restraint. Replenish, restore, because many a times we don't have, you know, this kind of, you know, uh, the attitude. We want to make use of it and then throw. And this is not correct. So the impacts on human activity we see as the population increases, air, water, all this ozone layer depletion, loss of biodiversity. So in order to have the sustainability, we should try to minimize our utilities. You have to have highest efficiency, reduce the cost and so on. But otherwise we will see so many companies, they have the pre-plantation program and they say, okay, we, I am doing environment program. They have some blood drive group and then they say that, okay, uh, I have a social accountability. I am socially accountable and also environmentally comply. No, it has to be well, these all three circles, planet, profit, and people. All the three programs should be sound. It should not be just greenwash, you know. So profit is very important. But after profit, you have to also say that people and the stakeholders of that company are happy and they are given proper wages. And the planet is not suffering, you know, just because of that profit. So environment has to be protected. People are to be respected and reduce the emission of greenhouse gas. We have to increase the use of renewable resources. We have to increase the use of renewable energy and so on. And so there are certain companies and the companies have been given the different, you know, the certification. If a company is environmentally compliant, we give them ISO 14001. Then if it is socially accountable and they take care of all the stakeholders and workforce, then it is SA 8000, social accountability, occupational health and safety. There is another certification and so on. But at the same time, government in India has also started that 2% of the profit should be used for a CSR uh, you know, activity. So I have now you know, in the near future, the attempts are being made for upcycling. That is the whatever you are having the clothing or are differing or postponing, the production by undertaking the responsible consumption. I will be able to take some examples only from, from apparel because I am a textile specialist and uh, we have a limited time. So old clothing, if you have. Many a times we say only 10 times we use the shirt and then we throw it off. But really, if you see individuals, our wardrobes, so many wardrobes are so much full, but still, and last one year we may not have used but then we want to still buy. And this is how, you know, the manufacturing goes, you know, unbridled. And that's how the global warming is increased. So steps involved in upcycling. We did one experiment, one of few of my students and collection of the old garment. They got the old garment. They were still could be put into the use. They segregated this old garment, which are 10 rupees per kilo. They got it. And then they looked at this garment and the original, and this is an upcycle. And then they, little bit of color, little bit whatever, you know, they, they did mending and refurbishing of this garment. So the original you can see, and this is an upcycle one. This is another one, garment, original, and upcycle. So after upcycling, then they put, you know, in our laboratory, they put it for sale. They iron it, and then they packed it, and they put it for sale. And when they put it for sale, this is the level of profitability they got. More than, you know, certain cases, depending upon this violet top or white frock or torn jeans, 500%, 250%, 63%. You know, in the big companies, the profitability in textile mill is not more than 20, 25%. And when you see this kind of a profitability, it's really unimaginable. That means that in, somebody can start his own shop or own business with a, almost no capital required and then make such kind of a hefty, you know, you know, the profits. 
Then there is another one is a polycarboxylic acid. This is another. I don't want to take you to the chemical uh, side of this and uh, bore you. But what is important is our clothing, you know, properly they are finished with a uh, eco-friendly finishing. Then they will not also crease or wrinkle. And wrinkle-free garment are always, you know, expected. Then there is application of chitosan, you know, you know, the shrimps are the, you know, the, are you, from the shrimp shell, you make chitosan. And chitosan is again a natural substance. So sustainability, wherein the natural resources are used. And then this kind of a chitosan, which is extracted from the shrimp cell, now one can have the fabric, which is finished with antibacterial material. And so the garment, when you wear that, it will, your, your sweat, the, when they give bacteria and they start foul smelling, so this is because of the, you know, this kind of a antibacterial finishing, one cannot get rashes, it will not develop foul smell and so on. And another piece of work wherein we say that presently, it's a garment to be kept in a form which is completely finished form. And then you can dye depending upon fashion because it's a fast fashion. Within 15, 20 days, you need to again give the whole lot, a new lot in the, in the store. And for that, again, this formulation, which is based on nitrogen-based formulation, one can color them as per the need of the fashion. Because today, not only the fashion, uh, you know, uh, fashion clothing has to be prepared, but it is also have to be as per the need of the people and fast fashion. There's another one is that the fabrics or the garments are now being sold on aroma, uh, the fragrance finish. And the fragrance, in order to have the fabric or the garment, which has got typical fragrance, and all these fragrance are from the natural oils, you know, and the technology used is micro encapsulation. So on the surface of the fabric or the garment, the micro capsules are, and these capsules carry these, you know, the uh, essential oil, like peppermint oil, lemongrass oil, or neem oil. And this one gives you the antibacterial property, as well as many a times, you know, you know, the uh, UV pro protection of, uh, ability and so on. And this, this kind of uh, antibacterial property from natural oils, you know, the fabric finish with this. So this is again a sustainable uh, ability uh, efforts we have taken. Then in the case of mosquito repellent cotton. So nowadays, again, in the third world countries, you will find that mosquito is a big menace. And to, you know, many of these natural oils, essential oils, if you use their mosquito repellent, just like uh, citronella oil and, and mosquitoes, what happens to the mosquito? Malaria, dengue, we all know that the ill effects of mosquitoes. And these are the oil, natural oil, castor, citronella oil, cedar oil, uh, you know, peppermint oil. And we use these oils, we encapsulated them, and we put them on the fabric. And that's how the fabric became mosquito repel. And we tested it. The mosquito, how many mosquitoes, uh, you know, repel, how many mosquitoes get killed, and so on. So this is a definitely, of course, there is a standard testing method of a mosquito repellent material. Then uh, nowadays you see that the oils are transported. And so many a time there are oil spills in the sea. And when the oil spills are there on the sea, then it is definitely a problem. The causes of marine oil spill are where, you know, the environment comes uh, into danger, aquatic life gets suffered. And so impact on the human welfare, it destroys marine life, impairs the, you know, the economic activity and so on. And so such an oil, when it's spread on the sea, you know, then the, how do you collect it? Or how do you clean this oil spill? And that is where we then uh, try to you make use of, you know, the na because nowadays they use a synthetic oil absorbent, but synthetic, again, are not, you know, eco-friendly. And so we use this, uh, you know, the jute fiber, acetylation and the jute fiber, or even I mean, coir fiber, we improved them and made them oil absorbent. And because of that, you know, you can see, this is the one left side, it is all oil is, uh, you know, spread. 
But on the other side, when the, the natural uh, oil absorbent, when we made, all the oil it collects. And you can even you know, squeeze it and get back and again reuse it. So this is important. Again, it's a natural, you know, the oil sorbent. And then at the end, you can then use it for burning too in the, in the boilers and so on. So then the, you know, we also use, you know, all know, Jawahar, wheat, bajra, raz, you know, ragi. Um, uh, these, you know, 30 to 35 percent of the food material gets wasted. And these food material, just because of good water, you know, conditions of storage. So they get damp in the rain and then they start, you know, germinating. So we use all this waste food material, not the good one. So it is all waste. And then we converted, from that we made starch and we also made super absorbent material. And super absorbent and starch, and these are used for printing. This is a super absorbent. You all know that, you know, the elders, they use, you know, the sanitary napkin. There, there are super absorbent particles. If there was no, you know, super absorbent, which absorbs 150 to 200 times more than its own weight, then otherwise we would have had, we couldn't have a baby pads or napkins or sanitary napkins or even for the, you know, the diabetic patient, the uh, intercontinent and so on. So this is a great technology and it is, it is we, we made this super absorbent and always, you know, multinationals are always using this, but there everything is patented, you know. And we also hear natural dyeing, we carried out natural dyeing. You know, in Siddhi Vinayak temple, just now Ganpati is over. And in this Siddhi Vinayak temple, in the morning, so many, you know, people put flower as well as coconut and so on. And in the evening, all these flowers become a big, big, big problem that where to be disposed. So I am, you know, there is a social enterprise. I am helping them and they collect these all flowers. And from that, we extract the natural color, marigold, hibiscus, coconut. And then this color we applied, on, you know, on the synthetic cotton fabric as well as on the silk fabric. And so accordingly, the different garments were colored. And these garments are sold at Switzerland, at US, and you know various departmental stores. These are the you know the natural dyed cotton material. So no synthetic dyes are used. All are natural colors. So yeah, these are these are very different different types of natural colorant. And this is going to be again more you know the newer concept of using natural modern and natural color is going to be there so that we will have a less burden on ecology and at the same time the colors are going to be skin friendly you know so end of the day we should remember that uh, you know the ethics should be at the core of business if we are talking about a sustainable you know uh, uh, development then sustainable development should not be at the cost of the you know neither the people nor it should be at the cost of the environment and uh, it should many a times if it is, it is good if it is the the material use is waste if material use is waste and it is upcycle and it is you know again put into the uh, cycle you know so that means that many clothes uh, we you don't have to manufacture I mean that much amount of raw material and the energy you can save so we have to uh, remember that this technology we have a lot what is important in front of in India in is we have a major concern is the development which is there, uh, you know, which already, uh, you know, the technological uh, advances are there. But the development has to be reaching to 5 lakh villages in this country. So sustainability, uh, every stage we should work, our operation uh, becomes sustainable only when we allow the spirit of sustainability. And this spirit of sustainability cannot come unless we commit or have this new mindset of gender equality, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam philosophy, because otherwise there are so many inventions happening, but then everybody has guarded these patents. You know, recently now this diabetics medicine, Janumet, after 20 years, the patent is loose. You know, they now open, patent rights are gone. So now this tablet is available at 10 rupees. 
earlier it was available for 34 rupees a tablet and you take two tablets so it means that you know whenever you have invention does not mean it is reaching to the common people the technology should be in the reach of the common people and for that only what it can govern is the ethical commitment of an individual because end of the day scientists or the people in governance everyone has a heart everyone has a soul and if his or her soul is enlightened then one would always keep some chunk of you know the money as well as you know kind of responsibility you know for the welfare of the those who cannot otherwise you know take advantage of this thank you very much thank you so thank much uh, for this very enlightening and uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, treatment of the the theme uh, of today uh, professor teli um friends uh, please share your if you have any questions i think we are we are a little above our time but mm. since we started 15 minutes late maybe we can go a little bit more uh, there are four questions which have already come in Mm. uh first one is success standards are set by society it is basis of these standards that i am respected by society can i ignore these standards if not how can change come no, no. You, know, you know that is that is the reason i did not say society standards most of the success standards are to what extent the person or a individual is well to do as far as his financial stability is concerned and as i mentioned that we cannot ignore that an individual has to have the good the, you know the you know the standard uh, financial uh, you know the sound financial stability but there is no end to this there is no end. and then as long as if the society decides and if we are going to go with the flow of the society then we whatever the situation which we are today we deserve to be there we deserve to be there so what is important is if i think that my you know the soul is an enlightened then my success standards i have to decide end of the day you know the even the villager is happy in the village but and with less of money or you look at our earlier you know the uh, kind of uh, uh, the life there you know when we were earning even one tenth of what i am earning today i was still happy so if we just leave it to society to decide our standard it is finally my life it is me who should decide and i shouldn't bother what so, so you know end of the day uh, society says you know most of my phd student they come from a you know these middle class family and i told them that you cannot compete with Uh, others you know um, by any other way so you go for higher education and i i help them to go up to phd and all. today what happens is that his education qualification nobody can rob it out and he has that standard and because of that enlightened way he is still happy with whatever he is getting definitely they are in a uh, you know the creamy layer of society but not as earn earning as much as even maybe they are you know counterpart who is not even a matriculate earning 100 times more but should he consider himself oh i am not successful but he is successful you know if he that is the case then it is our bankruptcy of mind okay uh, thank you professor the next question is what about role of ethics in the development of technology Hmm. does the question of ethics only come into play after technology is developed or should it govern also the choice and decisions made when deciding which technologies are developed yes after yes. whose needs is technology addressing the rich or the poor you know this is very very important very nice uh, important question is that finally it is not that you go on you know developing the technology just because you want to make use of your time and you have a scientific ability no depending upon the whatever is your agenda you want to serve the country or you want to because in every country has got a thrust area decided depending upon the needs of the country and so actually definitely 
we, we have to, you know, even Dr. APJ Kalam mentioned once that India does not need so many additional invention. What India needs is whatever so far we have developed technology, we have to develop the ability to take the technological advances to the doorstep of five lakh villages in our country. So, yes, I, I, you know, most of my, you know, the research areas, you will always find there is an element of sustainability. There is social responsibility. If that issue is not socially, uh, you know, important, then I have not investigated it. You know, that's, that's the thing. Thank you, Professor. The next question is, how can the masses who don't get high quality education mm. develop their scientific and ethical capacity? Now it is here again, Mav, you know, just recently we have seen that now the technology can, you know, uh, eradicate this particular gap. Because yes, definitely the masses don't have the high quality education. But that doesn't mean that they are, one cannot still, you know, develop the scientific capacity and ethical capacity. Ethical capacity is totally coming from your soul and the sanskar. So if you are internally driven, and uh, you then you have that ethical capacity, sanskar, and then the scientific capacity, depending on that, then you will go on not to be not to remain dependent, but you will try to take the destiny of your own in your own hand. And uh, so, uh, so, of course, in India we have a shortage of such good school or good education, but that doesn't mean that we have nothing. We have a lot. And there are so many people still they are, you know, uh, circumventing these situations they are coming from. It is not going to be the easy when, uh, easy life. But then the quality education, many times, many of us, now what do you call, call a call high quality education? I have come from, a, you know, the village and uh, maybe, you know, in a vernacular medium. And there, you know, the one teacher was teaching all three, four, five, six uh, subjects. But when I came to university, I put in my efforts and I was three times topper in the university. I did move excellently well. So it is, you know, again, that is our in my high quality education. Does that mean an air conditioned school? And then the, you know, the, uh, all that, you know, so that is, that is different because even a single one teacher can really inspire you to take up a subject. End of the day, what is education? End of the day, one has to study himself or herself. Only we have to ignite that, you know, the candle in his heart. So the next question, I think, is related to what you had, but it's a bit different. Can poor people afford to be ecologically conscious? How? Poor in other words, is, is environmental preservation just a luxury of the rich ah. uh, because usually the I mean you please correct me if I'm wrong but the prevalent conception is all that is organic that is ah. sold in the market ah. it is usually at a premium price yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. the assumption is that this is for the those who can afford mm. So, mm. is that the case is it <laughs> No, you, you know, there, there are different degrees of ecologically conscious. One can definitely, the you know, same poor people give you the lesson that when you have, you buy a shirt, after using that shirt and a particular service life is over, then you use it for, for you know, the mopping. Then for, for the further, you use it the same piece into, uh, you know, some other purposes. So you are using repeatedly and you are ecologically conscious, you know, and that's how we have been living the life. But ecologically conscious doesn't mean the organic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things to be bought. Because we poor people cannot do it. And many a times, even in the developed countries, you will find that if these also, the, I am uh, talking about the old clothing or return clothing, and if they do only that, then they will not be having manufacturing units. If they don't have manufacturing units, then they themselves will not have jobs. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a balance. Actually, it is the developed world who should pay for, you know, the uh, climate change and all. And it is the developing world 
which will start, you know, the manufacturing, but manufacture in such a way that you are not adding, you know, to, to the um, climate change or you are not adding to carbon dioxide footprint or, you know, and there are different new technologies are there, but it has to be, you know, the combination of those who already have so many years back polluted the world, they should pay mm -hmm. for it. The mm -hmm. climate change, you know, when <laughs> globally we look at it, is that. And uh, <coughs> sorry. And uh, the the poor people, they they also have to, you know, so they, they have definitely they would say that uh, we have right to progress, we have to manufacture, but they, when they manufacture, they will not do the same mistake which the developed countries have done, you know, unbridled manufacturing, come what may, uh, without, uh, you know, the consideration to the, uh, this one, environment, or exploiting the people. No, now they will do it, but they do it in a different way. And they will be financially compensated by those, uh, you know, the rich ones. So that's the kind of a climate, climate fund they make use of, you know. There's a lot of questions coming in. Is AI a dangerous technology? You know, again, 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 AI, you know, it, it depends upon how you use it. But AI, you know, the technology itself is never dangerous. Its use is dangerous. Now, for example, AI, because of AI, so many things have been possible you know, to just come to the conclusion that, oh, you have the, so much of data, all of a sudden, quickly, just on the fingertip, you will come to know what this kind of, this, what, what should be the cause of this particular disease, because you have enough data to come to conclusion. So AI per se is not a dangerous technology, but then unbridled use of AI for every single thing is not the correct, because you are, you know, the uh, um, uh, employer uh, uh, intensive industry. And when such thing is there, so many of the things, we should not do it just because the machine can do it, you know. So no, you have to provide the jobs to the, those people. Suppose, for example, if you buy a using, you buy and you, um, you know, you have money, you have a lot of money, you using AI technology, you can do things. And then, but then you don't allow any work to any people. What happens to the people? Will they be happy? If they remain idle, if they will, it is bigger, 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 you know, the problem with us. So it is not a physical well-being of an individual. It is an intellectual progress and intellectual, you know, what we can say that, you know, the upliftment and, uh, you know, the joy of working. The, I should look for tomorrow that, oh, I want to contribute to the welfare of the society. If somebody else has already done my work and I don't have to look for tomorrow, uh, that's, uh, that robs my fun. You know? So it's not dangerous. It, it is rightly to be used. In many fields, it is very, very useful. In many well, blindly, if one uses, then it is dangerous. Any technology, if blindly used, is dangerous. The, the next question is, what about indigenous knowledge and practices? How do we make sure in adopting modern science, ah. we don't lose the traditional knowledge and technology of India? I ah. think we can think of this also in terms of textiles. Like we had ah. handlooms and yes. there were so many, and there still are. There yes. are so many people yes. who are gaining their employment yes. by manufacturing saris in the traditional way, by, Correct. you know, khadi. Uh, so yes. it's just helpful to hear. Yeah. No, yes, very important, you know, uh, using up, you know, like khadi as well as handloom and uh, power, you know, the many, 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 uh, you know, we have a large industry, 16, 17 lakh people and there are handlooms are there everywhere. But then when you go for looking at, you know, the handloom woven saris and all, again, it is not in the reach of the common people because the production level is very low. Recently, one sari, one of the weavers said that it is worth 5 lakh, 
but one year only one I make it. You know, so end of the day, if such a such a case is so, you need to though you have a love for that technology, handloom is fine. But then again, there you cannot just go blind just because it is our traditional thing, a traditional. So we have to continue or our traditional medicine. Now, number of places it is required that maybe the traditional medicines also need kind of a, you know, uh, the, uh, the examination and standards of specification to be maintained. Recently, I was going to Ayurvedic shop. He said that I am not sure whether the standard is same, whether it is pure or not pure, and so many things. Even in um, modern medicine, you will find so much of, uh, you know, uh, adulteration. So in uh, traditional, in the name of traditional medicine also, things can happen. So again, the issue comes ethics, you know. So if the manufacturers or individuals or the people who are involved, they are brand and branded for ethical commitment, then things are easy. But it is, it is not starting from one person. It is more overall, we have to you know, see that holistically we commit for it. So we have a long uh, set of questions from Yasin. Uh, yeah. I can take maybe two of them and uh, the other question I can share with you by email because yeah. maybe on the call it may not be. Uh -huh. uh, he says, how can individuals make more informed and sustainable choices regarding their consumption habits? When yeah, the yeah. market either offers cheap, low-quality products which are hurting the health of consumers and polluting the environment or expensive organic, ethically sourced produce, sustainable products which are out of the reach for majority of society. Yes, yes, yes. So because finally, end of the year, uh, 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 very right. That end of the day, finally, how cheap it is, you know, the best made, best garment you give, but the, if the garment is not going to be in your reach, you cannot make use of it. And the cheaper ones, you know, I have seen in the, you know, in uh, Bangalore and everywhere, the certain dyes which are used, which are harmful to the skin, but they are cheaper and then people buy and without having a knowledge that this is going to uh, harm them. So, uh, though the need is there that the sustainable garments or sustainable you know technology to be used and these products should be made use of it but today they are again beyond the reach because basically because also um, that you know these are all naturally dyed material they are not as fancy as the synthetic one you know and so many a times people are not ready to pay more so again they have to compete with the price Otherwise, something which were, you know, the naturally colored material is going to be very expensive. And anyway, when the consumer has to accept that this is going to be expensive, this is not going to be that attractive as the synthetic material, uh, you know, dyed material. And also it cannot be not necessarily fancy one. But then that kind of a, you know, thing a consumer is not prepared to. And as I said that end of the day, yes, uh, slowly, a situation will come that we have to become a responsible consumer. You know, we need to have, we have to ask 10 times whether, first of all, we have to start refusing anything to buy, refuse to buy. But then again, it is dependent on if you don't buy, the companies will not work. The company, mm -hmm. you know, the people will not find job. All this is interrelated because somewhere the societal structure has not guaranteed that every individual will have certain standard of life. Mm -hmm. So he or she has to work and earn his own living. And then he has to compete. Like, for example, the, oh, you know, the your poorest of poor, he has to also buy the turdal 200 rupees kilo. And I may be earning a one and a half lakh rupees. I have to also buy in the same cost. Now, where is the... <laughs> Justice, you know, but this is this kind of a free market economy. So there are, are limitations. I do agree that these are uh, challenges. 
uh, maybe with the last question we can take regarding the harmony of science and religion and the relationship between religion spiritual values and ethics mm. how to make sure that when we include religion in the discourse of ethics sustainability business and development mm. we are mainly focusing on the civilization building principles Mm. and the unifying spiritual values of religion which empower individuals and communities to collaborate together yeah and avoid bringing on some traditional features of religion which have plagued the history of human kind such as sense of superiority prejudice division and harmful superstition yeah uh, i think i think his uh, you know the in fact the question has the answer in it <laughs> his question has an answer in it you know so basically yes true because most of the time other than you know the uh, working on the goodness of religion and how religion has in fact civilized the character of the world religion the we if we go for looking there are so many examples where the religion was misused and you know and those those elements when there were division superiority nobody gives us right to you know call ourselves superior to others and all that thing but then this universal human values which are there in built in the religious belief now if we work on them because end of the day these positive contribution of the religion should be you know nurtured the same is the positive contribution of the technology and both these both are science and both when they are properly balance then whatever we do or we apply the technology that technology will not be short lived it will have a sustainable you know the uh, sustainability element and it will remain sustainable it will contribute you know, sustainability is not also a destination it is you know is a whole dialogue and it's a whole mosaic in which it will definitely positively contribute Thank you so much, uh, Professor Teli, for this very enlightening and st stimulating uh, uh, lecture and discussion. And I'd also like to thank our participants who joined us. Uh, on there are still patiently with us, also we are we are beyond our time limit. Uh, joined us on Zoom and also on Facebook, friends. Uh, this lecture recording will be. Uh, Uh, put up on our youtube page and it will be shared with the participants uh, we hope that uh, you benefited from this uh, very stimulating uh, reflection on uh, the very important and and contemporary in fact today it was in the news i was just thinking of uh, this topic with the passing of uh, dr m s swaminathan who is Mm. one of the founders of india's green revolution so it's really a very compelling subject for india's development to to really understand how technology can be brought in to uh, promote the sustainable development without compromising the ethical uh, frameworks which are so essential to uh, ensuring that development does not lose its bearings Thank you, Thank Professor you. Kelly, again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, and and uh, we we look forward to meeting again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank. You.